going to chat about what I call the true Maya apocalypse. It's obviously setting itself up a little bit of opposition to many of the things that uh, we're hearing about at the moment. John uh, Hoops, in his sort of masterful survey of how the 2012 phenomenon really took off uh, in the Western world, um, sort of kind of slightly sidestepped um, how the sort of the, the kind of core things that uh, have um, spurred and inspired uh, the origin, the real origins of the 2012 stuff. Um, and we know, of course, from the Popol Vuh um, that these ideas of cyclical world destructions are very, very important. So I just uh, quote one here. We, we of course have these um, uh, destructions of the world based on alternate creations, where the gods make man out of different materials. Uh, of course, in the first case, we have animals. Uh, they were uh, barking and making sense, were cast off into the forest. <coughs> then man, or humankind, was made out of mud, um, but they crumbled. They fell to pieces. They were no good. Uh, and then here, the, the third creation were people made out of. Uh, and they, they reproduced, they were successful in many ways, um, but they certainly did not remember their makers. And for this reason, the, God dis the gods destroyed them, and they destroyed them by a flood um, that came down upon their, their heads, um, and then there was a resin from the sky, so it was kind of dark, you know, horrible rain. Uh, as we also know that their, their utensils, their cooking utensils, rose up against them and smashed them to pieces. So um, this, of course, uh, is the most familiar object uh, when you, if you hit Google my calendar, this is what you see <laughs> in virtually every single little box. It's, it's really disheartening. Um, we were actually going to have a, a piece in the exhibit especially about this. We, we decided in the end that we'd just be perpetuating the myth. <laughs> People would just, they'd see the image, but they wouldn't read the caption. It's not um, but of course, uh, this is, uh, in a sense, really is about the same subject. It's about world destructions, it's about the separate ages and the different sons of the uh, Aztec belief system. Um, and this is uh, representing the four movement. This is the final uh, son, the fifth son. Um, and the, the fourth son um, was named for water. In 50, 52 years, there was water. These people died by drowning. They turned into fish. The skies came falling down. They were destroyed in one day only. So this is also the, the previous destruction. In the, in the Popol Vuh, of course, we go on to be people to be made out of maize in the present day, and no further destruction is necessary or mentioned, even potentially. Um, in the Aztec case, it's different. They're waiting for the world to end again. And this is why uh, the various sacrifices and, and ceremonies must be performed to try and keep the world going. But of course, the similarity here is very strong. Um, and it's interesting, and I know that I'm not alone amongst a series of epigraphers, and I think, I think both Dave and Mark, we all agree, um, that this is suspicious. If you, if you go back and look at the deep Maya stuff about uh, creation, or as much as we understand it, we don't have anything about multiple world creations. Um, the whole uh, 13 Pakatun cycle plus the Popol Vuh cycle have been sort of glommed together as a sort of inevitable union, whereas in fact uh, that doesn't really exist. Instead, we find something which is either pan-Mesoamerican, uh, but possibly quite late, uh, or indeed, because we know that the Guatemala Highlands had a lot of influence from central Mexico, maybe the story from the Popol Vuh isn't really Maya. 
which would be a sort of a heresy in many ways. Um, but let's talk about these things in a little bit more detail. So certainly the, the ideas of, of destructions of races and of fire um, is very common. Stretches over the real, the whole area of Mesoamerica. Uh, so the yellow ones, of course, are the loss of ancient races, people who've been previously destroyed or died out, um, and white uh, by the fact that there has been a world flood. And in the Chinapalams, in the Yucatec area, so not just the Guatemala Highlands, but also in the north, uh, there's, there's parts of the Chumayel that talks about a sudden rush of water when the theft of the insignia of the 13 uh, gods uh, of the Hunahu occurred. Then the sky would fall, would fall down upon the earth when the four gods, the four backups, were set up and brought about the destruction of the world. So again, there's mentions of flood and there's talking about skies falling down. Uh, quickly, too, in the Mani and the Kizimi, uh, the same kind of things, we have avalanches of water, torrents of water there too. And again, mention of year bearers, uh, the bakabs, the people who are standing at the corners of the world supporting the sky. And uh, if there was any question that maybe the, <coughs> there was influence uh, from the Christian uh, religion with uh, the biblical flood, I think <coughs> the universality of this idea is already suggests that isn't the case. But they, the priests explicitly say that when they arrived in Yucatan, the people already knew of the flood. They also, <clears throat> they also had news about the fall of Lucifer and the flood, and the world shall end by fire, and blah, 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 blah etc. Uh, and it also mentioned as a lizard. Um, they painted a lizard that meant the deluge and the earth. <clears throat> so, um, let's go back into Maya documents and see what the Mayas themselves have to say in the post-classic era about some of these issues. to us in particular is the Dresden Codex because it's the most detailed um, and it offers um, sort of wonderful illustrations. There's a section here from pages uh, 69 to 74 which are known as the flood pages uh, and you can see <coughs> flows of water running down at various parts of the text um, and then we arrive here um, at the famous destruction scene that we'll talk about. It, <coughs> it goes on traveling in this direction um, and it's followed directly by uh, four pages which describe New Year ceremonies. And there's some wonderful meshing together with things that Landa says about what happens in New Year on this, and as we'll see in a minute, uh, in Madrid. Um, and here in particular, I need to pick out Carl Tauber as someone who, in his dissertation, uh, worked on this relationship of the different codices, because I think that work is not fully disseminated. It's never actually published in its original. So what, what we're seeing is the different year bearers, so the people who are associated with those uh, backups or, or people at the four corners who are pivotal to the universe, um, and the ways in which the days uh, of the uh, sacred round are distributed. And they all follow this flood period. And this flood, this sort of destruction uh, iconography, uh, continues in Madrid. Um, and so we find the rain here with these various black gods uh, and this female um, deity we'll talk a bit more about. Uh, and once again, the flood pages lead directly into a series of pages describing the new year. So this relationship is very important. And it also continues into the uh, Paris. So over here, we've got to change the direction because uh, unlike the, the Dresden and Madrid, uh, in this section, the Paris is actually traveling this way. Um, and what we have is a series of eclipses. This is the famous um, uh, uh, constellation uh, iconography with eclipses and uh, biting animals. I won't, I'll touch on that, but not too much. Um, then we have another red painted scene, a little bit like, in that sense, the <coughs> uh, scene, which we'll call here sky binding. Uh, and then over here, uh, iconography associated with the flood. Again, this is, I'm just repeating them here, we go on to two pages that describe the new year. So in all three of our major Maya codices, they contain uh, repetitive, uh, closely related sections. 
that describe uh, some sort of flood event with deities and pouring water, uh, followed by a red painted uh, or involving a red painted uh, background that introduces the new year. What's going on? Calendrically, we're talking about the transition between Wayeb, which is the five days at the end of the uh, solar year, the vague year, the half, um, and the introduction of Pop. So all those New Year sections are days of happening at the seating of Pop and into one Pop. Um, our flood scenes and our destruction scenes are taking place in Wayeb. It's true in each one of these cases. And this is uh, repeated in some of the other documents where uh, Wayeb is associated with uh, bad news. Uh, the days of crying, the days of the evil things, unbound is uh, hidden, open is the underworld. There will arrive a time when these days will be the end of the world. So there is this relationship between Wayeb, the end of the year, and the end of the world. And I think what we're looking at, we'll increasingly see, is that the end of the year is metaphorically linked to the end of the world. So um, page 74 of the Dresden Codex, it's a very, very familiar image. Uh, John showed it yesterday. Um, and probably, you know, if we're sort of really looking at serious images of apocalypse, it, it is the, the pivotal, the iconic image. It has a text at the top, um, which actually Carl had to go at interpreting uh, back in the 80s. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it's damaged, uh, and as ever with Dresden, we have post-classic uh, late inscriptions. They're rather difficult to understand. Um, the syntax of them is odd. Um, but here we have something which is, captions, um, which seems to be associated with rain in some sense. And there's a mention of a black sky, uh, black earth. Um, there's mention of this deity we're going to talk about in a minute, Chuck Chell. Uh, and also Chark is involved, and possibly uh, one of the first spellings of Bakar in the sense that we find it in the post-classic <coughs> as a sky bearer. Okay, so what's going on in the image? Well, first of all, there's a giant lizard. There it is, uh, the huge sky cane. Um, its body here uh, is a sky band, so we have stars, sky signs, sun signs, etc. Um, it's a hoofed, crocodile, and here with water flowing out of his mouth. And of course, this is the direct uh, descendant of the classic, uh, uh, classic crocodile <coughs> sky, the sky came um, So the same sky band body, uh, the same deer hoofs, uh, and here a black uh, liquid pouring out of the mouth. Um, let's see the rear hoof over here. And down below, um, the <coughs> most, one of the most famous images of Chuck Chell. Goddess O, the great, in this case, destroyer. Here she is. Um, the diagnostics are her serpent in her head, headdress, uh, her jaguar features, claws, uh, and mm -hmm. ear, here, um, and her uh, cross uh, bone skirt, uh, and here with this uh, vessel turned upside down with water coming out. And Goddess O seems to have this dual character. She is the, the midwife, she is the, the learned medicine woman, uh, she is the carer of the young, possibly in this case the, the actual uh, carer of the maize god with the elongated uh, head. Um, and so this is a nurturing, this is the, 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 the old woman of the village, kind of like idea. Um, but equally there are figurines uh, which show the other side. The other side is the jaguar features, the jaguar ear. his face and also the war peg, the shield. Um, and she recurs in the, the uh, Madrid Codex. Um, again, water flowing, this time I think it's a profuse sweat, uh, drowning the world in her uh, sweat, <laughs> possibly urine too. Um, and so this is a, a continuation of that motif. Of course there are other deities involved. Um, this is sort of another, what we think is another version of her, but plus also Chark, as you'd expect storm god. Uh, and also this other character, much more mysterious, the black chart. Uh, this is, uh, black body color, of course, is mentioned in that text on page 74. We don't really see too much of this character in the classic period. 
Now down below, there's a figure that took a little bit of time to sort of isolate who we had here. Um, it's a black god. Uh, he's armed with his, uh, his darts and what may be a drill. Um, it's a little bit hard to say what that is. It's some sort of star. But the key thing is the, um, the bird up here, the owl. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm sure, the same character uh, in the Madrid here with this sort of very abbreviated kind of feathery uh, headdress with the same black uh, and the same warrior uh, stuff. Uh, and of course, it's, it's God L, um, as we'll come to a little bit later. This is the Lord of the Underworld. So the Lord of the Underworld is involved in this episode of War Destruction. Also involved are eclipses. Um, we have these uh, signs, which um, are a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse, also pouring water. And eclipses um, are very, very prevalent when we get into the ethnography and the ethnic history, talking about uh, dire. So the face of the, sh the sun uh, shall be turned from its course, it shall be turned face down during the reign of the perishable men, the perishable rulers. Five days the sun is eclipsed, and then we shall see the torch of Khatun 13 Ahau, a sign given by God that death shall come to the rulers of this land. So again, eclipses are uh, a key part of these very deep forebodings. And eclipses, as, as many people here will know, are treated in great detail section, earlier section of the Dresden Codex. And the iconography of this is really quite important. Um, betwixt a series of um, basically predictive tables uh, which uh, give notes of potential dates when either solar or lunar eclipses may occur, there are a series of icons. Um, and they pretty much sort of illustrate what's going on, um, probably representing simply an eclipse in each case, but represented in different ways. So we have the biting motif. We have here something that looks like a piece of textile with this curved edge. Uh, perhaps another piece of textile here over the sun. Um, here, uh, a death god sitting in a bone throne. That doesn't seem outwardly directly connected. Uh, and here, the sort of diving star deity. Um, and right up into modern times, uh, eclipses were being uh, discussed as uh, terrible things. Eclipses are greatly feared because it's believed that a total eclipse of the sun or moon would cause all the domestic instruments to be transformed into living creatures and kill their master, revenging themselves for the bad treatment they have suffered. So this is, uh, well, this other part here, another belief is that Juan de Dios will destroy uh, the earth on the day when the sun is covered with a black curtain. So interesting that this uh, domestic instruments thing up again. And also about the black curtain, um, because here we seem to see curtains covering the sun uh, and being one of the sort of metaphors of eclipses. Um, so this is one of the more contentious uh, pair of pages in, in my iconography, uh, endlessly discussed. Uh, many authors have written about the nature of uh, these particular icons, uh, and I'm not going to join that in, in great detail. But I simply want to point out that it's a river of water that is running through these eclipses. Um, and uh, whatever these particular animals are signifying, uh, this is eclipse iconography. This is destruction iconography. Uh, as we are progressing into that red painted page in the Paris Codex. Okay. I'm nip through the back of this such detail and talk about. Um, a little interesting um, date information that's thrown into these eclipse pages. Not well understood, but clearly very important. Um, it gives us four how a kukum. It gives us this uh, so-called creation date back from 3114 BC. Um, and so here's the 13 bakhtuns, 130000. 000. Um, and it gives uh, eight days counts forward to uh, 12 or not. So we added that, and it would now be because 13 we zeros back in that 13, uh, 3, 5,000 years ago, 0, 0, 0, 0, 8. Um, and it is just simply called um, Tiha, at water, or in water. It's the only piece of information given for this event. There's another one. Here. Uh, it's a distance number that counts towards the second in water, the second tiha. And it's eight kings, uh, one we now, five half. And here is the calculation. So right at the beginning.
beginning of the current era. There are events involving water, uh, which these eclipse pages are in some sense back-referencing. Again, this connection between eclipses and water, very, very repetitive. And finally, there's this uh, rain icon that we, I mentioned briefly before on the destruction page itself. Um, some a couple of things we don't understand well, but pouring water that comes through the same distance number and ends up on the day of 4M. Um, and we'll see in a minute why this turns out to be important. Because uh, when we have the great uh, Chuck Chow, Goddess O, in her destruction phase, it's exactly this number which is pouring out of the vase and leading to the day M. It's one of those things that Carl noticed in his dissertation. So, Eclipses, water, deluge, and the destruction page are all linked together. And uh, this is a representation of these eclipse destruction events. This is a, an illustration which follows those eclipse pages. Okay, so what about Paris? Is the other red painted page, what's the connection there? Well, we don't actually, on the face of it, immediately we don't see eclipses. But if we look carefully, we can because down here is an eclipse sign, and it's connected by a piece of rope here, colored in green. And here are the same biting giant uh, serpents, which we'd see in some of the eclipse iconography. All right, what else is going on? Well, there's a couple of guys here with bone headdresses, so they are actually um, death gods with death collars on. Uh, and up above, we have characters with this um, knotted uh, headdress, the Ipsan headdress, uh, which marks them Uh, and very pointedly, they're sort of sitting there doing nothing. Their, their arms folded in a very kind of relaxed, chilled out kind of way. Um, and the sky is beneath them. This is one of the things that kind of threw people initially. It's like, well, they, they can't really be the, the sky bearers because the sky is below them. Um, I think this is the sky crashing down. I think that this is another a comparable scene of world destruction. Um, what's happening is there are eclipses also involved, but the sky bearers, as uh, talked about in the had let the sky fall. The red painted background, I think, is the clue to the fact that these scenes are, are closely related. And um, it leads into uh, a section which deals with flood. Um, it's very damaged, um, but we see the cord that previously flowed through the eclipses coming down here to a uh, sun sign with radiating centipedes. Um, a water flow coming down here, and you could just see the serpent coming up to bite it. And here is another familiar character. It's the same black god. It's God El, the lord of the underworld, with his feather headdress. So we do a little bit of imaginative, well, first of all, cleaning up, um, and then a little bit of reconstruction. We see the death god on one hand with a, a cigar, cigar uh, the biting serpent. So these are closely parallel. The Paris, on the face of it, looks very different to the Dresden, but actually the contents are extremely similar. And we can extend this uh, iconography back into the classic period. Um, what we find uh, here on a particular vessel, K5359, is a, si a scene of um, overthrow, a scene of disaster for God L. Here he is over here, um, but he's been stripped. His clothes, his cloak, his hat, and his star, and indeed his jewels, are being thrown into the air by the hero to him. <coughs> Marked out as the, the jaguar uh, pelt jaw of uh, Charles McKay. Uh, and between them here is a character on a bone throne uh, who has been uh, sacrificed, who's been killed. There's blood coming out of his chest, but there's a serpent coming up to bite this uh, eclipse. This is a classic version of the eclipse sign. And we have the moon goddess talking to her rabbit. So this helps identify that we're really talking about a lunar, uh, a lunar event. The text, uh, this is probably a, a name for God L, and this may well be pseudo-Dirtus Okay, so this is just to highlight the fact that there is indeed, uh, the focus of this is the denuding of God L. And for those of you who know other ceramic vessels, that this is something that turns up uh, elsewhere, that God is defeated, uh, usually actually by the maze god, rather 
rather than by the hero twins, but they are now closely implicated in his downfall. And I mentioned here the, the reaching up of the um, sacrifice, uh, ultimate uh, death god here, the sent to be headdress. And of course, the Popol Vuh talks about two worlds in the underworld. Um, most classic iconography simply shows us God L, sort of reigning supreme in the underworld. It's still a little bit uncertain as to who this character is, um, but we can see in a minute that he actually exists uh, elsewhere. This is not the only depiction of this scene. The very, very famous Prince of Bath, of course, um, which uh, I think probably everyone who's had any experience with Goliath will know well. And what we're interested in, well, here's of course God L seated in his palace. Uh, and out here, uh, a very important scene. <coughs> what we see are two um, characters wearing pretty clearly masks. They're both armed with axes. And this one is chopping the head of this character who is, has got darkness markings. So he's an underworld uh, uh, character. Quite humanoid in this case, but uh, certainly an underworld character. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the meaning of this. And uh, Mike Coe came up with various ideas. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, it is Justin Kerr who really first suggested that this is the episode in the Pop or Boo where the hero twins uh, return, supposedly dead, they return to the underworld, to the court of the, the Lords of Death, uh, but as entertainers disguised. Uh, and they involve themselves in sacrifice. They sacrifice dogs, they sacrifice each other, uh, and ultimately uh, they sacrifice the Lords of Death, which they conveniently um, but we seem to see a very sort of powerful echo between this late episode and what was going on during the classic period. So we don't need to match every single part of the Wu story because it's a much, much later version. We're looking here, I think, at the original of that story. So here's their beheading in more detail. And this highlights the fact that out of this guy is coming this serpent. And this is an iconography which we see repeated again in the Dresden. Um, so sort of reaching <coughs> out with this uh, serpent that's coming out of the center of a death god near a bone throne. And you can put the pieces together, therefore make it a little bit clearer, and compare them that this is really the same motif that we see uh, on that um, uh, classic period vessel. We have the bone throne, we have the uh, death lord, we have the serpent going up to grasp at an eclipse. And there are at least 600 years, probably more, between these two images. So they, this is a very powerful icon that has been preserved through my art for many, many generations. Again, of course, we saw the death god sitting on his bone throne uh, in uh, the eclipse uh, images of the Dresden cover. And again, in the Madrid, we have these odd icons sort of scattered around, sort of prophecies. Uh, the death god here with a jar of water pouring down on him. This is a flood. So to sort of put it together, what, what's happening, I think, is that there is a, an episode of world destruction. Uh, the gods uh, fill the world and indeed also the underworld with water. And I think this torrent of water is something which is particularly directed at ending the reign of uh, the king of the underworld. And that's what we find surviving in the whole world. Um, the same story, of course, here in Madrid, that rain is pouring down from eclipses, the sky band, it's really the same story. Uh, and even the late version of God El's name involves uh, water and rain pouring down. So this seems to be, uh, we don't see this name written out this way uh, in the classic period, um, but this connection between deluge and the Lord of the Underworld seems very strong. And just as a, as a final image, the thing that I think will sets it all off, is that um, much later in the Dresden Codex, seemingly unrelated, we see Chark, the rain god, uh, in a canoe. Um, and sitting here is a pack. This is, of course, God El's also a merchant god. There's a pack, and on top of him is the feathered headdress of God El. It's almost as if he has rescued the paraphernalia, the insignia of God El, which is now sort of floating uh, after the deluge has sort of, uh, swept the mark. So, um, what I think 
is, is going on, and is contrary to some very recent interpretations, is that uh, the Dresden page, 70, uh, page 74 is about destruction. It is about a series of apocalyptic visions that Maya did have, uh, that continued through their history and uh, survived in various kind of ethnographical uh, sources. Um, it isn't linked to the long count. It isn't linked to the 13 back to the cycle, or at least not this one. Um, but in all our kind of keenness to sort of sweep away uh, dark uh, visions from the Maya and talk about all the positive things, uh, they did themselves foresee a world destroyed. Thank you very much.